Well, thank you guys. Welcome to Church of Grace. As always, it's, uh, we're thrilled to share the word of his grace with you so that we all grow or understand his grace more fully, grow in his love, and then go make a difference in the world. Amen? Hey, you know what? God filled you with himself. He gave you grace. He gave you forgiveness. He gave you his love, not just that we hoard. It's not the nature of God to hoard to myself. He wants out. He wants the world to know how special he is and how much he loves them and how much he cares about them and how he's planned for eternity past for this moment between you and him where they get to hear about the goodness of God. I'm thrilled to be sharing with you tonight. We're continuing on forgiveness. And what I want to talk to you tonight is, is, the, is the title of my message is Game Changer. The game changer that forgiveness brings. Forgiveness is the game changer that leads to relationship. Have you ever had anybody owe you money before and like didn't pay? Anybody? Yeah. yeah. Does, it make, does it make the relationship a little awkward? Yeah. Say you're... <laughs> We, we see that he, he has a lot of people that owe him, I guess. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't owe you anything, do I? Well, I don't act like it. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, but, you know, whenever someone owes you something, there's always going to be an awkwardness in that relationship because there's that guilt or that debt on that person's conscience, and it's easier to ignore the person you owe than to face it. Because, no, look, nobody likes to feel guilty. It's not like, oh, I can't wait to feel guilty today. Can I get a shot of guilt? How about a little bit of shame, please? No, nobody wants to feel that way. So when you owe someone something, the subconscious route our mind is going to take and our body is going to take is the endorphin route. Like, I need to feel good, so I'm not going to go here and see this person because I'm not going to feel good because I owe them money and I can't pay them. Amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I remember one time my parents, they had given some money to an individual as an investment. Well, it, it turned out to be a sour investment that didn't come back as anything, and the money's gone. And immediately those individuals, the relationship immediately changed. They weren't as friendly and so forth. And it wasn't because anybody did any kind of sin or anything. It's just now there was debt on the individual's conscience. And so my mom and dad, they had to go and say, look, we forgive you. We forgive you of that debt. It changed the game. See, what they did was they turned something that wasn't good into something beautiful. They turned something that the devil was going to use to hurt relationship and turned it into something that made the relationship even stronger because you've seen me at my worst and you love me still. You've seen me when I was down and you forgive me. It's beautiful because without the, without the attention of sin that you wronged me and I can accept that wrong, then I'll never be able to forgive and express grace and mercy. See, when we sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it was a terrible, evil thing, yet God turned it around to make himself a gainer. See, you and I aren't just forgiven. When Jesus came, we had the greatest debt known to man called our sin debt. And none of us could pay that debt off. It was an eternal debt that we needed a savior. And so when God sent Jesus to pay that debt, he didn't just pay it in full. He didn't just go, how much you owe? You owe 100? Okay, here's 100. No, his blood paid so overwhelmingly the sin debt that God today isn't just paid off. He is made richer, if you can say that. God has become now a gainer, which is why he's not upset at you no more, because he's happy because of the blood of Jesus. Man, if you can understand the value and the preciousness of that blood, your sin will be so little in comparison to that blood. And that's why God said, I'll never be angry with you again. You and I are having an everlasting covenant of love. He changed the game. God changed the game of humanity where we had this debt on our heart, this debt on our conscience that rather than being dr drawn to God, rather than being drawn to him and pursuing him, we ran away. It was never God who ran. It was always us who ran away. Why? We didn't want to face the shame, and he wants you to know tonight there is no more shame for you. In fact, Isaiah 61 verse 7 says something so crazy. It says, instead of your shame, you shall have what? Double honor. So instead of me feeling guilty before God, instead of me feeling shame before God for the wrongs I've done, yes, I have sinned. And, it, and if you knew me, you knew it was a lot. In fact, you know, some people want me to pray for them. If they knew me as much as I know me, you would not want me to pray for you. 
You know, we see, because I'm up here or something that I've got more of it all together. Man, well, you know, I, I just got to trust God more and more every day because I see Josh, I'm like, dang, you can't do this, man. You, you need some help. I, I tell you, it's at least once a week I feel like, how do you preach? How, how do I put a message together? Literally once a week. I'm like, what am I doing? Anyways, but what is it? Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. God became so rich, so blessed off of the blood of Jesus, and it was so paid that now when you come before God, it's not shame you feel. It's a double portion of honor. Wow, he is honoring you. He is praising you. He is lifting you. That is amazing. Is it because of something you've done? No. It's all because of the blood of Jesus, which is why when we come in here together, I love church. Do you love, I, I just, I mean, even if I wasn't saved, I think I'd still come. Because, I mean, where else can you find a group of people that are just going to love on you? Where else can you find a group of people that are so fired up and passionate about something invisible or someone invisible? Where else does that exist? And there's an actual presence. There's an actual power. There's an actual person that we gather around when we come together. It's so powerful. But you know, with all this talk about forgiveness, with all this talk about that you were forgiven not just of your past sins, not just forgiven of your present sins, but forgiven of all your future sins. Well, you say, I don't believe that, Josh. We're not forgiven of our future sins. I just need to remind you that you were born in the year whatever, which is at least 2,000 years after Jesus died. So all of your sins have been committed in the future. So if your future sins aren't committed, if your future sins aren't forgiven, guess what? We all going to hell. We are not forgiven. But is it safe? Is it safe for a preacher or for the gospel, the doctrine of Jesus, to say that you are totally and completely forgiven? Is it safe to do? Because there are many preachers that believe it but won't teach it. Why? Because they are fearful of what you might go do. Well, if they think they're just completely forgiven, what's going to keep them from going out there and just living a lifestyle of sin? That's human, carnal logic. And anytime you bring human reasoning and try to mix it with the gospel, it will not work. Because this gospel is all about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit revealing truths to you and I. And when we hear as a human, well, if I'm totally forgiven, what is going to keep me from sin? The answer is not what, but who. Because no longer now am I living to please the flesh now I'm living to please the Savior who lives within me. And now I'm not governed by a set of rules that tell me what to do and what not to do and what to wear and what not to wear. I'm governed by the Holy Spirit within. Self-control is not me having more willpower. Self-control is my spirit man filled with the Holy Spirit living out of me. That's true self-control. Is it safe to preach all that? Well, let me remind you about the clause, the, the clause of the new covenant that makes it all work. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says this. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their what? Hearts. And in their what? Minds. I will write them. And he adds, how can all of that work? Because of this. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember sometimes. I will remember here and there to remind you of how bad you're doing. I will make sure to, 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 to remind you when you wake up about how I'm disappointed with how well you're doing. I saw what you did last night. I saw what you did last week. I saw those thoughts in your dream. Yeah, only one person knows what I mean. I saw that. And I'm going to call you out on it. Is that what God does? No. No, he says he's never, ever going to remember him. How can that be that God never remembers it? And then he says this. I will remember them more in verse 18. Is it not there? It's not there. Verse 18. Well, anyways, he says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins. Wait, did I read that? I, whoa, I just had a brain fart right now where I was. Anyways, it's good news. Whatever it is, go after and read it. But the point is, Romans. let's go to Romans chapter 4. Is it okay if I make a brain fart? Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'm forgiven, thanks, Sammy. Romans 4, your sins are covered. How can God never remember your sins anymore? That's, that's wild, man. That's wild that he'll never remember your sin. He's not going to bring it to your attention. How, is, how can that be that God just forgets? How can he righteously do that? In Romans 4, verse 7, it says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are 
covered. Oh, well, that makes sense, right? Like my daughter, Layla, she, one of her favorite things to do is after you use the restroom and you flush the toilet, she likes to run and hide. She likes to hide from you. She's not very good at hiding, but she's getting better. And a lot of times what she'll do is she'll try to find a blanket or something to put over her so that I can't see her. See, so what God did with your sins is he didn't say, well, I'm just going to ignore them. He actually put them somewhere where he can't see them no more. And they are not under a blanket. They are under the blood of Jesus. So for God to remind you of your sin would be for him to dishonor his son and his son's sacrifice and blood. Amen. He will not bring to remembrance your sins or impute sin to us anymore. So is that safe? Is that safe to live a life that I'm never going to have sin imputed to my account again? Is it safe for the Christian to believe I am totally and absolutely forgiven forever? Is it safe? Turn to First Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1. How are we doing on time here? 558. We're good. We're, we're moving. We're chugging. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who, uh, who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Some have said, Josh, I wish I had, I, I, people, they don't know my name or whatever, they say, I wish I had the faith that you had. Well, what did you do with it? Where did you last put it? Because my Bible says we all have the same like precious faith, the same faith Peter had, the same faith Paul had. Watch this, the same faith Jesus had. Because it's his faith. If you've got the faith of Jesus living on the inside of you, <clears throat> what is your future going to look like? What are your dreams? What are your ambitions, your hopes in life? If they, if they can be accomplished without faith, that ain't the plan of God. Let me say that again. If your dreams and ambitions in life can be accomplished without faith in God, it is not God. God, the only thing that brings him pleasure and the only thing that he has planned for your life is going to require a relational trust factor. It's going to require you and him walking together. It's going to require you trusting in him so that he can get things done. Why? Because you ain't getting any glory, bro. No flesh will glory in his presence. He gets all the glory. And when it's done and when people see what has been accomplished in your life, you can't say, well, yeah, I did. I, you know, I worked real hard. You know, I did all this. No, it was all him. It really was. All I did was just trust in his promise, what he said he would do. I counted him faithful and voila. Like precious faith. Verse two, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That's awesome. Grace and peace, not just added, but multiplied. Multiplication gets bigger. As his divine power will someday give us all things when we get to heaven, to life and godliness. It's not what it says. No, no. That, you guys, you guys, come on, come on, come on, come on, class, class. Let, let's try that again. As his divine power will give us one day in heaven all things that pertain to life and guys. Oh, it's so nice they're in heaven now because now they're out of pain. It's so nice that, you know, once you get to heaven, there won't be any more strife. Once you get to heaven, there won't be any more sickness or disease. Hey, guys, that's the whole point. It's because Jesus said, pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why you and I are still here. It ain't good enough to say one day in heaven it will be. It's supposed to come out of our mouth right now. And that's why he gave us faith. And that's why he gave us everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's not okay to speak something as if it's one day in heaven going to be because now you're doubting the whole reason Jesus came. He didn't just come to save you. He did, but he, also, he came primarily for us to have relationship and for his kingdom to reign. And every time you step out of this building and you step out of there filled with the Holy Ghost, I went old school, filled with the Holy Spirit out there, the Holy Spirit wants out and wants to transform wherever you go. And guess what? He's never not working. He's never not doing. And the further I talk to him and learn from him, the more I see that he is busy. 
I used to think, man, Holy Spirit, when are you going to do something? But I realized it wasn't him. It was me not seeing what he was doing. I was looking at all the wrong things. I was looking at people and seeing their faults and disasters and, and saying, man, this is a hopeless cause. What am I going to do with you? And it's as if I'm going to take the change instead of just trusting in the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, what are you doing right now? Holy Spirit, this person right here that I just came across, what are you doing with him? Anything? I didn't sense anything. Okay, I'll, well, I'll let it go. Maybe over here. Ah, I feel like there's something over here. Hey, uh, uh, let me talk to you, man. You're going to punch me in the face. I know, but I'll take one for the team. Come on. You know, the Holy Spirit's constantly moving, constantly working. Jesus said, the Father is always working, and so am I. Jesus said, everything the Father does, he shows me, and then I do likewise. He said, the Son can do nothing of himself. This is Jesus, perfect, the totally God and totally man who said, I can't do anything of myself, but it's the Father within me. He does the works. So what did Jesus do? He walked in this earth looking for what the Father was doing, not looking at what the devil was doing. He was not conscious of all the evil and wickedness because it was going on. There were Roman brothels where there were children that were thrust into prostitution. There were all kinds of evils and wickedness going on around in that time. Yet Jesus went around doing the work of the Father. What is the Father doing? What is the Father saying? And he would say and do whatever he saw. That, my friends, is relationship. And that is the relationship I want with him. That is the relationship I'm pursuing that everything he thinks, everything he says, and everything he's doing, I can align with, to just, with step in step, man. Like every right, when he makes a right step, I make a right step. And the best part is when I can do it unconsciously being so filled with the Holy Spirit, so filled with his mind, so filled with the mind of Christ that when I step out these doors, guess what? People look at me and they think they see Jesus because they're supposed to. Amen. That's what a Christian is. You aren't filled with the spirit of Josh or the spirit of some saint or the spirit of some dead guy. You are filled with the spirit of Christ. Hey, and if you are living by faith, you ought to see the spirit of Christ in you. You ought to see that anointing coming out. You ought to walk in power because it's the spirit of Christ, not the spirit of Josh. It's his spirit. It's him that will raise the dead, not you. It's him that will raise the sick, not you. It's him that will open my blind eyes. But guess what? He needs your hands to reach out and touch. He needs you to align with him because you're a co-laborer. What a blessing. He could have chosen to just come do it all himself. But no, he loves you so much, he wants to do it with you. He wants you to feel the joy of a job well done. He wants to see the joy of him, of you partnering by faith with him and seeing someone who's invisible be manifest before the very eyes and people fall down on their face repenting. I don't know about you. I'm a little fired up right now. I feel like I've been drinking a few (laughs) shots of Holy Ghost. Charlene, you got that hanky out? Where's the hanky? I know we're in your Belinda. We got to be a little dignified. But excuse me if I go a little Anaheim on you. (laughs) Having fun. As his divine power has given us to all things that pertain to life. That is just awesome has given us all things, has given. You have it already. You have it. You have it. See, 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 check it out. This Bible I have, it's mine, right? Wouldn't it be silly for me to say, man, I wish I had my Bible? But that's the way some of you are about healing. That's the way some of you are about the promises of God. I wish I had this. God, I wish you would heal me. What, what are you talking about? It's already yours. You already have it. He's already given it to you. See, now my confession and my belief system is different from trying to get it to already receiving it, to already having it. I'm not trying to get God to move because by his grace, he already has. So I'm not trying to get God to move. God, if you would just pour out your spirit, if you would just move in your Belinda, he already is. He is already loving everybody. His grace has already made everything available. He's waiting on you to get off that rear end and go out and start speaking truth. I I promise you, when we get to heaven, when we see who we were now, when we see the glory that's in us right now, we go, oh my gosh, what did I do? I'm telling you, there ain't enough impossible preaching coming from the pulpits. If, you're, if the message you hear is not impossible, I'm telling you, 
it ain't really God. You got to hear the impossible to bring you higher. You got to see God is wa- working on a different level than us. His, his thoughts are not our thoughts in the context of human thoughts. He is thinking something far beyond us. He is thinking 20 years from now. He's thinking 100 years from now. He's thinking generations and generations from now. And once you do this moment, this little act of faith and trust in him will impact generations to come. There is no insignificant action in your life. Whether it's sin or whether it's faith, there is no insignificant action. It is all leading to something. Verse 4. By which have been given to us, I'm going to just speed this along. Verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you actually might be a partaker of the divine nature. So God gave us promises that we would be a partaker of his very nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Again, is preaching total forgiveness safe? Let's see what he says. Verse 5. But also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, which is moral goodness, moral excellence, and add to that knowledge, which is sound doctrine and wisdom. To that add self-control, which is self-control not from outward, but spiritual dominion, that your spirit is ruling your body, that your self-control is coming from within. You are led by the Holy Spirit from within. It is not more willpower. It is not more strength. It is the Holy Spirit constraining you. It is the Holy Spirit leading you. It is the Holy Spirit guiding you. And to that self-control, add perseverance. Perseverance is not sitting here waiting, twiddling your thumbs. Oh, God, one of these days you'll come through. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting, just waiting. That's not perseverance. That's not patience. Patience is hot, white expectation and not leaving it. That I, that whenever you hear the word wait in the Bible, and I'm waiting on God, I'm waiting on God, it is not just sitting there waiting for God to do something. Again, God's already done it. It is I am sitting here expecting God. I am expecting his word. I'm expecting manifestations. And perseverance means I'm not changing. Come what may, circumstances change, and it looks like it's getting worse. I'm not changing. I am going to continue expecting his grace. I'm going to continue expecting his goodness in my life. I am not going to allow circumstances and things in my life to change my expectation. And guess what? We can't even do that on our own. It's by the power of God. And add perseverance, godliness. And godliness is really reverence for the things of God. That you respect his word. It hasn't become common to you. When you open it up, you're not thinking, well, I got to read this today. What's in my... No, you pick it up to hear from God. You pick it up. This is going to change my life. Right now, it's... it's, it's I don't know what time it is. And I, I'm opening this Bible up, and it's going to change my life right now. Treat the word with, the, with reverence. And to, to godliness... Brotherly kindness, which is the Greek word Philadelphia, which is brotherly affection and love between Christians, between brethren, between one another, that I'm putting you first, I'm loving you. It's, it's affectionate towards one another. And then the biggest of all, love, which is agape love, God's kind of love. So he says, put on all these things. And I heard a preacher one time say, you got to have effort. you got to put work into this. And I used to try, and it never worked. All I could see was my deficiencies in all those things because I forgot and so did the preacher. The first line there is add to your faith. Faith is the foundation for all of these fruits. Faith is a place of resting in what God has done. Faith is a place of resting in Jesus' finished work. And when you enter that place of rest and trust in his promises, his nature begins to show up. His nature begins to be expressed. Look what he says here in verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can actually know God, know about him, be saved, be a Christian, come to church, and you are literally barren and without any fruit in your life. Why? Because these things aren't abounding. Why? You're not walking by faith. Why? You're not looking at the promises of God. Why? Because you think sometime, someday in the future when you get to heaven, that's when God's going to do something. It all goes back to the very first verse of knowing him. I'm a little out of breath. I'm going to need your help. Look at this in verse 9. For he who lacks these things is what? Short-sighted even to blindness. And what happened? What happened? Why? Why? has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. 
So instead of living in the freedom of forgiveness, they are continuing to remember not what God remembers. They are remembering the sins of their past. And when you remember something, you are meditating on it. So you are meditating on your mistakes, on your failures, and you are literally handcuffing yourself to your past. And you are in bondage to your past behaviors. Not understanding that the grace of God has already broken those chains and you are free to walk in newness of life. You are free to walk because you aren't a slave to sin anymore. You are now a slave of righteousness. And this person that is lacking in these things has forgotten that they were cleansed from all their old sins. What did we say last week in Psalm 103? David said, soul, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases. Forget not. What's the end game of this? As we see here, knowing that you're totally forgiven and living with the consciousness that I'm forgiven does not lead to sin. It actually leads to a productive, fruitful Christian life. The more I hold back and preach some message that says, you know, gives greater value to sin than the blood of Jesus is the moment you will go out and continue living in bondage to your old sins. But the moment you start valuing the blood of Jesus and you start seeing and valuing the son more than you do your own works, good or bad, that's the day you can start walking in freedom and in grace. So now that you're forgiven, what's the end game? In Acts chapter 10, it's the first time a Gentile and his family and friends are going to hear the gospel preached for the first time. Cornelius, a Roman Italiano, he's giving alms to the poor. And he's blessing the Israelites, the Jews of that, of that day. And one day when he's in prayer, an angel appears to him in a vision and says, Cornelius, your arms, alms have come up to God as a memorial. And he hears your prayers. He says, go send for a guy named Simon. And so he gets out of this vision and he sends a soldier and a couple guys, sends him to go grab Simon that was with the, uh, the house on the shore. Uh, I think the guy's name of the house was Simon the Tanner also. I could be wrong. Though. Sorry. And he goes and he finds him. And just so happens to be at that time, that the guys are on their journey to get Simon. He's up on the roof about to pray. And he starts praying, and immediately he falls into a trance. And he starts seeing this sheep come down with animals on it. And God says, eat them. And see, Peter says, no, 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 no. I've been saying Simon a lot. His name, I don't know why. Simon Peter. Peter, you know him better as Peter. Anyways. You guys okay? Okay, good. Okay. Just making sure we're on the, we're on the right track. Okay, so he falls into a trance. He's like, God, I'm not going to eat those. Leviticus says don't do that. You know, Pastor Tom, we're still trying to get delivered. He doesn't want to eat pork. You know, we're still trying to work on him there, get him delivered from that. But he, he does look like he's 40, and he's actually 73. So, I mean, no, he's not 73. I apologize. A little jab there, but it's okay. He, <laughs> he can whoop me at golf. So, anyways. So, Simon, it, Peter sees that, and eventually God does it three times. And finally, he's like, all right. And God says, look, don't call anything unclean that I have called clean. What he's saying is there's been a game change. See, the blood of Jesus wasn't just for the Jews. The blood of Jesus wasn't just for the elites. The blood of Jesus wasn't just for this person or that person over there. The blood of Jesus was for humanity. And an invitation was given to all mankind to come and feast on this, at this dinner that the Father has provided. And he goes, and he goes to Cornelius' house, and this, my friends, is church right here. What does Cornelius do? He is expecting the word of God. He's, he's waiting for the messenger to come to give a word from the Lord. Guys, every Sunday, you've got people that God has ordained in music and in worship and in the message to bring you a word. You come expecting and when you come expecting, God answers that expectation. I like one preacher said, expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. If you, guess what? If you aren't expecting something, guess what? Don't expect something to happen. Did you catch that? If you aren't expecting God to do something right now, guess what? It ain't gonna happen. When the man that was, that was crippled and sat at the gate called beautiful, 
He said, Peter and John, he saw them. He said, hey, alms for the poor. And they said, silver and gold, have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. Well, first he said, look on us. And it says that he looked at them expecting to receive something. He didn't receive money. He received the healing power of God. And he got up, but he was expecting. And so Peter goes to deliver this word to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius invited all of his family and all of his friends to hear the word of the Lord. And Peter shows up, and I love it. We're going to jump in there. Oh, okay, we're good. I'm just, I'm just about done. I'm closing with this. In fact, um, Nick, you can come on up. Uh, so, Acts chapter 10, verse 34. And this is Peter's message. I love it. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. I love it. Because he's not supposed to be there in a Gentile's house. He'd be considered unclean for being. He's not supposed to associate with that group of people. Isn't church awesome that we, all different skin colors, types, of different money levels and education, yet we all gather together as equals. All in Christ Jesus, where there is no difference of race. We are all brothers and sisters bound in peace and in harmony in Christ Jesus. I love it. It's so beautiful. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Christ Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were pressed by the devil, for God was with him. Verse 43, to him all the prophets witness, catch this, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, Whoever believes in him will receive remission or forgiveness of sins. And Peter's just getting fired up like like me, you know. He's just getting wound up. Man, you're going to be forgiven. You're going to receive forgiveness of sins. And guess what the Holy Spirit does? He completely interrupts his message. He doesn't let Peter get the, the applause. He doesn't let Peter get the ovation for what a powerful message that was. The Holy Spirit immediately interrupts him at what point? The moment he said they would receive forgiveness and the people believed it, the Holy Spirit is not waiting a second more. Why? The end game of your forgiveness is so that you and him can be in relationship. He forgave you of everything so that he could be one with you, so that you could be his son and his daughter. Immediately, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And that Greek word, for fall literally means embrace. It's the same Greek word used when the prodigal son returned home to the father. And the prodigal son was out living a crazy life. And all of a sudden he said, you know what, I'm hungry. I need to eat. He didn't come home for the right reasons. He didn't come over, he didn't come home to repent. He came over to repent, yeah, but because he was hungry. It wasn't love for the dad or love for the family. He comes, but guess what? The father was outside every single day with his eyes on the horizon waiting for the son to come home. And the moment the father saw the son, it wasn't sin on his mind. It wasn't all the debt that that young man owes him. Through wasting his inheritance, that was not on the father's mind. Relationship is on the father's mind. The individual is on the father's mind. So he's not just interested in what you do for him. He is interested in you. He wants you. And when the son, he saw the son, he did the undignified thing that a Hebrew father wouldn't do in those days. He picked up his skirt, his his pants, with anywhere pants, whatever that thing's called, and he began to run at the son. And the son had this whole speech rehearsed, like, I'm going to, I'm sorry for doing everything I did. Please make me like one of your hired servants. The father wouldn't even let him say that. Because you can't earn love. You can't work for being at a, at, the, at a seat at the dinner table. It's given. And the father grabbed him and embraced him and kissed him, kissed him and kissed him and kissed him and kissed him and kissed him. And what do you think that son's feeling? Oh, what do you think? See, the moment my life changed was the moment in the midst of all my sin and crap, I heard God say, I love you, son. And I heard and felt the embrace of my father love me in my worst. That shame and that guilt that I had on my mind immediately vanished. And I 
immediately received that double honor, honor I did not deserve. But you know why I have it? It's because Jesus gave his life. Because Jesus, through his blood, reconciled us to the Father. He made us one. The end game of this is not just so we can go play church and do different things. The end game is, look, he wants you to know him, and he wants to know you. He wants relationship with you. See, when he forgave us of our sins and made us the righteousness of God, and he now indwells us, and we are now one with him, guess what? You were made compatible to walk with him. You are not one day going to be compatible to then hear God. One day I'll be spiritual enough to hear God. One day I'll be spiritual enough to follow him. And we make it complicated or difficult. You have been made compatible by the Father to be led by him. You have been made compatible by the Father to live in his presence, to hear his voice, to walk in his power. He loves us so much. And I just feel tonight, there's a, he wants to embrace you. He really wants to embrace all of us. That's what I felt with Pastor Scott. That's what I felt here was an embrace by the Father. Hey, I forgive you. He wants you to know how forgiven you are because he wants you to draw near. He wants you to be intimate with him and have relationship with him. Talk about your days. Talk about your challenges because even in the midst of your challenge, the answer is not a thing or a method. The answer is a person. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell in the fire, it wasn't some formula or method that got him out. It was Jesus who was in the fire with them. And not a hair on their head was burned. He's with you. He's in you. He's around you. And immediately when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in tongues and glorify God. It's the first thing they did. They began to build themselves up. They began to speak directly to the Father in this new language the Holy Spirit has given them. One of the most in tongues more. Pray in tongues to the Father more. That direct line of communication that you have with Him. It builds you up. It builds you up. And it's glorifying your Father. To have everybody's head bowed and eyes closed. Lord, we just thank